Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives, jobs, debts, incomes, all of that, for us, for our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I want to begin today by shouting out to the students at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. They are doing something remarkable that is happening on more and more campuses across the country. They are acting in solidarity with workers at the college, the people who do the work, provide the meals, fix the buildings, clean the property, all the hard work that goes into but is rarely recognized. And Smith College has been doing what so many have, trying to make more money by understaffing, overworking, underpaying their workers. You know, it's a sad commentary, but it's a way that these kinds of elite schools uh, prepare the young men and women uh, that go there for their lives later on in a capitalist system that reproduces people at the top who get very nice service and people who do all the work and get mistreated. But here's a difference. The students aren't sitting by and simply watching or ignoring. They're getting out there and they're working with those workers. In particular, local SEIU, local 211. And the solidarity and the commitment of the students and the workers to get a better work program that'll help the students, that'll change the feelings and atmosphere of that university, and that will be a mark and a blow against the kind of abusive, rich versus poor exploitation scenario that Smith should be ashamed of, but that these students are doing something to change. Hats off. To the young women particularly, Smith is a long-standing uh, school that has been focused on educating women. And I wanted to recognize the remarkable solidarity they're showing and the difference that they're making. We're also going to be talking about Cisco, a strike there, Starbucks striking, the automobile industry. So let's jump right in. I want to start with the automobile industry because it is such a statement about where we are in the United States today. Here's the basic story. The automobile industry has made a commitment to become a smaller industry, more profitable, but smaller. What do I mean? They're producing many fewer cars. They have no intention of selling the kinds of new cars that they used to. They are accommodating the change in America. The rich at the top who can and will be paying a lot of more, more money for a new car. And the rest of us, we are going to be living on used cars from now on. It's a split in the market. New for the rich, used for everybody else. And boy, does it symbolize what's happening. But let me give you the numbers. The last two years, the two years of the pandemic that we were told, you were told, I was told, were years of difficulty and compromise, have been the most profitable in the last 10 for the automobile industry. You know about how over the last year we've been hearing about a shortage of chips and supply chain disruptions. Don't believe it. What we have here is a classic move to reduce the supply of new cars and jack up the price. In the last year, we recorded the highest average price of an automobile, new automobile purchase in the United States, $48,000. Since the end of 2019, that is before the pandemic hit, prices are up 30% for new cars. You get that? 30%. The production of new cars is way down, down 22%. So they cut the production, told us stories about chips, told us stories about supply chain disrupted. But what they were doing is classic elementary economics, cutting the supply, jacking up the price, and guess what? The profits went up. In other words, they got more of a benefit by raising the price 
than they lost by selling fewer new cars. And that's why they did it. It was the most profitable strategy, which we know because it was the most proper, uh, most profitable year for them. And as I believe I've told you more than once, the supply chain disruption nonsense was just cover to make it seem that it wasn't their decision to cut back production, but of course it was, to make more money by charging more, which of course is what they did, and the proof are the profits they now so glowingly show. But the bottom line, it's a decline of the American standard of living. Kiss the new car goodbye. You're not, between the price of it, and the now higher interest rates that mean the monthly charge will be even bigger because the price is higher and the interest charge is higher. We're changing America, and if you didn't want to face it before, now the very car you're sitting in will be a constant reminder of what the reality of U.S. capitalism means to you and me right now. Cisco Systems is a company that delivers food all over the country, particularly the institutions. And there was a strike recently uh, at a number of their plants, Plimpton, Massachusetts, Syracuse, and in Arizona. And in each case, the drivers of these delivery trucks, members of the Teamsters Union, set up pickets outside. But then something remarkable happened to the normal story of picketing. The workers involved called on other Teamsters in the area around where the strike was going and said, come help us, join our picket line. The stronger, the more numerous we are, the better chance each of us. How about we help each other? And they did. And the picket line swelled from a few dozen to a few hundred and then a thousand. And guess what the company did, what it always tries to do, went right into court because some of the Teamsters lined up their trucks so that the scabs driving the trucks in place of the union workers couldn't get to the trucks or they could get to them and couldn't get out of the parking area. And so they went for an injunction, which the courts gave them to begin to prosecute the truck drivers who did this so-called secondary strikes. And it didn't work. There were just too many Teamsters and the business began to break down without trucks. It can't pick up the food, it can't deliver the food, and it won't get paid by the institutions to whom it doesn't deliver the food. They had to settle. And you know what they did when they settled? They gave these truck drivers an enormous increase, 30% over two or three years, if my information is correct. Much better driving conditions, much better working conditions. And here's what I enjoyed the most. As part of the settlement, the company withdrew the injunction. No truck driver threatened with any kind of legal action will have to face any of it because that's what the workers demanded. And the mobilizing of solidary strike assistance by other Teamsters made all the difference. Workers have the power, if they're willing, to realize it and use it. That's the lesson here, folks. And let's see the lesson being played out, or at least it could be played out, in another venue, Starbucks. You may be surprised to learn, I was, that there are now 250 Starbucks that have been unionized. What was be a trickle at first has become a flood. The old CEO came and gone again because he couldn't stop it like he pretended he could. And so he's gone. But the company is doing very classic stuff. If you lose the vote and your workers now have a union because they voted it in, you have to sit down and so-called bargain in good faith. Well, turns out Starbucks has been stalling. Suddenly, workers couldn't participate in meetings via Zoom with the management. Why not? We've had two years of doing everything with Zoom and other kinds of delaying tactics. And so the question is, what is the union, the 250 Starbuckses that are union, what are they going to do? Well, I'm going to take a lesson from what the Teamsters just told us, and I'm going to take a lesson from what uh, the students at Smith College 
are showing us. You need solidarity. And you know what? People in the community who understand what's going on, let's go and help the workers at Starbucks. Let's go out front with picket signs and talk about why we're not willing to buy at Starbucks as long as they treat people the way they do. Wow, the workers wouldn't have to take the risk of being fired because they're not out there. We are, the rest of us are. And that might mean that when we have the issues we're most concerned with, we could appeal to people at Starbucks to help us in exactly the way the Teamsters helped each other. It's a very important lesson, this solidarity, and the Starbucks is a perfect example. And then there's the, the thing we talk about here, worker co-ops. How easy would it be to set up a co-op across the street from a Starbucks where a bunch of us set up a little business helped by the rest of us who will go there, not to Starbucks, etc., who will patronize and celebrate what it means to have a decent workplace not subject to the kinds of pressures Starbucks. Here's a chance to use worker co-op and strike as weapons that the labor force needs to use for a company that has showed its bad faith over and over again, and it needs the public, doesn't it? My last update that we'll have time for is about the fakery going on in the media that I always have to deal with. Here's the notion. Wages going up is the cause of inflation, or to blame inflation, on rising wages. Let me be very clear about the economics and then the, the mere factuality. First, the economics. Wages is one of the costs a business has. Every business knows that at any time, any of its costs can go up. The electric company can jack up the rates. The uh, coal that's delivered, if you have that kind of uh, utility, that can go up. The lawyers you hire, they can charge more. The inputs you need, they can go up. Every business does that. It doesn't pass along every increase in higher prices because it can't take that risk. What it does try to do when one price of something it buys goes up is they try to figure out, can we squeeze more for less out of somebody else? For example, if the lawyers say, we want bigger fee, the company says, well, we don't want to give you a bigger fee. Fine, say the lawyers, then we won't work very hard on your law cases. See where that gets you. Oh, you know what the lawyers are doing? It's called a strike. They're threatening a strike, a slowdown, a work stoppage, and they're going to get their money. But the company, if it has to pay the lawyers more, will look for where it can offset it. And if the workers are weak and if the union doesn't fight, they'll take it out on the workers. And it's exactly the same way if the workers are strong and are powerful and demand a wage increase and get it, that's the job of the company's employers to find other economies somewhere else. Don't ever accept the idea that if the wage goes up, then the price must or necessarily does. That's never been true. You need an analysis to understand it. But it's a wonderful excuse for employers who raise the price to make a bigger profit to blame them, the workers, that they're just doing it because the workers demanded wages. We're currently living in the United States, 8.5% inflation, more or less. Workers are getting 5% more. You cannot justify 8.5% inflation if all the workers are getting is 5% more. You know what's going up a lot more than 8%? profits. And that's why prices get raised. That's what the automobile dealers were doing. And that's what the rest of the system does. We've come to the end of the first part of today's show. And please stay with us now. We will be right back with author and professor William Robinson. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I am very pleased and proud to bring both to our microphones and to our cameras an author whose work I have admired for a long time. His name is William I. Robinson. He's a distinguished professor of sociology, global and international studies, and Latin American studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Among his award-winning books are A Theory of Global Capitalism, 
Latin America and global capitalism, and global capitalism and the crisis of humanity. I want you to welcome with me Professor William Robinson. So let me start by thanking you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, let's jump right in. Your latest book, Can Global Capitalism Endure? Tell us briefly, what do you mean by global capitalism? And what do you mean by the kind of shocking question, can it endure? Yes. Well, global capitalism is facing simply an unprecedented crisis. We here are on uncharted territory. This is a multidimensional crisis. First of all, it's obviously economic or structural. The world right now is on the brink of another recession, but I am uh, predicting in this book that it's going to be much more severe. We're facing another collapse, maybe much more, much more serious than the 2008 global financial collapse. But this is also a political crisis of state legitimacy and of capitalist hegemony. And the post-World War II international order is violently cracking up at this time. It's also a social crisis. We've never seen such levels of social disintegration around the world. The social fabric is collapsing in communities and whole countries all around the world. This is what we can call in technical terms a crisis of social reproduction. Hundreds of millions of people moving into the future, billions of people will not be able to survive as this crisis deepens. And finally, because we have this four dimensions of this crisis is the ecological dimension. We're facing a collapse of the biosphere. And because of this dimension, it is existential. It's existential. And um, it's not clear that we're going to be able to survive. I'm, I'm, this crisis can be drawn out for decades. But I'm arguing in this book that the 21st century is the final century for world capitalism. And the big question is, can we overthrow this system because, before it destroys all of humanity and much of life? on the planet. To put this in technical terms, we're facing the historic exhaustion of the conditions for capitalist renewal. So this is a crisis like none other. And let me add that the ruling groups here are clueless. They don't know how to resolve this. They've moved into permanent crisis management. If we take this back just a little bit in history, we can say that over the past 40 years of this neoliberal era, the world capitalism has been driven forward by this triple process of globalization, digitalization, and financialization. And the outcome of this at the economic level has been the accumulation of enormous, unprecedented amounts of wealth by the ruling groups, by the 1%, while the masses have been driven uh, uh, downward. So we have this problem of surplus capital. Transnational cap capitalist class, that's what I call it, has accumulated enormous amounts of wealth that it cannot possibly reinvest or even spend. So as you very well know, Richard, you're a you're brilliant economist. We have this mass of fictitious capital. What I mean by that is capital that's not it doesn't correspond to the real economy of goods and services upon which we all depend. And so we have this unprecedented mass of predatory finance capital, and it is destabilizing the whole system. Now, I'll add one other thing here, and that is the flip side to speaking about surplus capital is surplus people, surplus labor, hundreds of millions, billions that have been locked out and marginalized, surplus humanity, and those of us who do have employment and can fit into this global economy face these increasing precarious conditions and struggles for survival. And there is, this is the good news, there is a global revolt underway. Class and social struggle around the world is intensifying, it's heating up, and so the ruling groups have a dual challenge here. One, how do you continue to make profit in the face of chronic stagnation? And how do you continue to have the global economy move forward and of try and avoid that collapse, which is coming anyway? But the other big challenge that the ruling groups face is how do you contain this rebellion from below? So we're moving towards a global police state. Actually, we're in that uh, 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 global uh, global police state. So actually, I'll end with one other point. I know I've been a little bit long-winded here, but one other point we might see as this Again, immediately we're facing a collapse, but there can be a recovery, temporary recovery from that collapse, although the system won't make it to the next century. But the ruling groups are hoping that the introduction of new digital technologies that really took off during the COVID pandemic, that that is going to 
resolve the crisis and bring about some new period of prosperity. That might happen temporarily, temporarily. But for that to happen, we would need radical reform in the system, and especially radical reform being a distribution of wealth downward on a global scale and a re-regulation of global markets of the global economy. And currently, we don't see that at all. Wow, that was a that was an overwhelming uh, summary. And thank you very much. But now I want to push you, and I want to draw out how you see certain things given the framework you've just laid out. So, in 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 quick order, number one, where do you situate the Ukraine uh, war in all of this story? Yes. Well, the Ukraine war. What well, the Ukraine war has done is that it has aggravated all of the conditions of this crisis. But we need to be um, clear that the Ukraine war did not cause this crisis. It's helped escalate the crisis. But on the contrary, it is an outcome of this crisis. It is a consequence of this, um, of this um, um, uh, global crisis. So what's happened is that first the Ukraine war has aggravated all of these dimensions. We know that that it's shot up energy and food, uh, energy and food prices. Uh, it's leading to an intensification of political unrest around the world. We know all of that from reading uh, the headlines. But at a deeper level, also, it's boosted what I call militarized accumulation. And here, let me explain what I mean by that. So I mentioned that the, the global economy is in this long-term stagnation since 2008. The crisis of 2008 has not been re resolved at all. But the global economy has been sputtering forward on the basis of several mechanisms pushed by the ruling groups. One is debt-driven debt driven growth. Right now, world, worldwide debt is approaching $300 trillion. We've never seen anything uh, like that. That includes corporate debt, consumer debt, and government debt. That can't continue, and it's not going to continue. The other thing that's pushed the global economy forward in the face of this stagnation is wild financial speculation. Everyone's been talking about it. That we should. That we should. Let me give you one dramatic piece of data if we have time. The real economy of goods and services is valued at $75 trillion every year for the whole world, the production of goods and services. Whereas speculation just in derivatives, which is a speculative instrument, is now one quadrillion dollars. So this financial speculation can't continue either. That's why we're seeing the collapse, for instance, of the cryptocurrency markets. So the third mechanism, which has kept the global economy going, and this is linked now to Ukraine, is what I call militarized accumulation, meaning that the ruling groups promote wars, they promote social conflict, they promote and expand systems of transnational social control and repression just as a way of accumulating profit because it's enormously profitable in the face of stagnation in the civilian economy. So Russia invades Ukraine. I condemn that invasion. We all should be condemning that invasion. But on the other hand, that's given what I refer to as the transnational capitalist class, especially in the United States, the justification to massively expand military spending to further militarize the whole global economy, and not just the United States, the other big countries in the world, um, from China to, uh, to, to, the, to the European Union countries, to India, are all rapidly expanding their military budgets. So the Ukraine invasion has va vastly intensified the militarization of the whole global uh, economy and society. I'll add real quickly, I know this is a lot of detail and I know we're limited on time, but also there's, it's also accelerated the, again, this violent breakdown of the post-World War II international order. Uh, and I'll just conclude, there's um, one important point to, to make here, and that is that the invasion is accelerating a shift towards a politically multipolar world with all of this geopolitical tension, but within a single global integrated economy. No country and no region can withdraw from this globally integrated um, uh, uh, economy. And actually, no country can really stabilize the global economy. Um, so, I mean, that's some of the issues involved with this, the, the invasion of Ukraine, when we look behind the immediate headlines. That's exactly what I was looking for you to, to contextualize. So let me do it again in another way. There are people uh, who believe that we're at a kind of nodal point. The British Empire is in its final stages of disintegration and apparently taking England with it. Uh, 
the, pa the, the baton, you might say, was passed to the United States a century ago, and we've had a century of a, of a U.S. empire. That now seems to be in, in decline, and we're looking at what may well be a Chinese empire uh, coming to the fore. And yeah. so that we're at some kind of enormous nodal shifting point among empires. How does your view of of a global capitalism interact, or what light does it shed on this notion of shifting empires? Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastically important question. And this is, you know, this is exactly what's going on behind that the, the, the headlines. And you're right, we've had a long string of, in social sciences, we call this hegemons, a hegemonic center, which anchors and tries to stabilize the system, sets the rules for the whole, you know, worldwide system. So yeah, we started with, with the Iberian Peninsula, uh, hegemony. It went to Dutch hegemony, and as you just pointed out, British he British hegemony in the late 17th to the early to throughout the 1800s, and then of course the U.S. Empire, the U.S. hegemonic power in the 20th century, and that is in decline. It's cracking up. You're absolutely right about that, and you are also right that the center of gravity of the of world capitalism is shifting to China. But here's the difference with earlier you know, hegemonic powers. This is taking place, this shift to China, the, the Sino-centered world system, uh, within an integrated global economy. And that China is not, China, no country can withdraw from this integrated global economy uh, and society. So China cannot play the role of a global hegemon that stabilizes the system in the way that the United States did in the 20th century or the, or the British did in the previous um, century. There's this intense competition among states. The competition between the U.S. and the Chinese state, et cetera, is very real. Those geopolitical tensions are reaching the breaking point. They're even threatening us with nuclear war right now. Um, but I have to stress that given the global globalized economy of the 21st century is different than earlier centuries of world capitalism. The extent of, of worldwide integration and interdependence is such that there's no withdrawal from it. And even if China becomes the political center, right, and the economic center of gravity of the world economy, politically, it's not going to be able to stabilize the system. It's not going to be able to resolve this crisis. This crisis is terminal. We've, we've been predicting, you know, every time there's a big crisis, some of us get it wrong and say, that's it. Capitalism's now ending. It's always proven more resilient. But this time, it is different in the long-term perspective. It can be dragged out if we, if we survive, if we don't have a nuclear war that brings us down. It can survive for a number, number of decades more. But even if China rises as the new global hegemon, this system is in a terminal crisis. Um, our grandkids, uh, you know, won't survive if they make it to the 22nd century if we haven't overthrown it. Uh, but yes, what you're saying about China and this crisis of international hegemony is very real and very dangerous. Wow. All right. You have been very generous with your time and your speed in covering these topics, you know, can stand as a model for many of us. Uh, thank you very, very much for your insights. I'm particularly interested and will follow up on this interaction between the globalization of capitalism on the one hand and these empires that can't be what they were in the past. Thank you very much, Professor William I. Robinson. And to all of you, I hope you learned as much as I did. And as always, I look forward to speaking with you again next week.